I had good personal relationships with Seymour Stein, Mo Austin, Lenny Warrenker, even the chief executive of Time Warner, Gerald Levin. In fact, right before the shit hit the fan, I'd just been up at the Time Warner World Headquarters in this massive boardroom, speaking to Gerald Levin and all the top dog executives. That was a pretty big deal. They didn't have every artist on Warner Brothers up in their board meetings. They had guys like former President Nixon speak to them about economic and political issues. I was there with Quincy Jones talking to the executives and board members because we just won a Grammy Award for Best Rap Performance by a duo or a group for Back on the Block. We were their golden boys. When the cop killer storm hit, the Time Warner executives understood the stakes. Ice, this is a bad day, Seymour Stein told me. Because once we allow them to tell us what we can and can't do, what we can and can't release, this whole division of music is pretty much through. Warner Brothers was the home of the edgiest artists of the time. Prince, Madonna, Slayer, Sam Kinison, Andrew Dice Clay, The Ghetto Boys, and me. Almost everybody considered raw and edgy signed to a major at the time was under the Warner Brothers umbrella. People often make the mistake of thinking that Time Warner put pressure on me. They never put an ounce of pressure on me. I made the move on my own. When we were kids, if you were my buddy, and I threw a rock and busted a school window, and we both got in trouble, I'm going to tell them it was just me. I'm going to take that weight. You had nothing to do with the shit. Same with Cop Killer, I decided. I wrote the song, I'll Take the Weight. I said to Warner Brothers, know what? All I got in life is my integrity. If you want, we can pull the song off the album. Critics were already saying I did the song for the money, just to be scandalous, but I didn't give a fuck. The Body Count album was going to sell without that song on it, so Warner repressed the record, sold the Body Count album, and gave the Cop Killer single away for free. But even with that concession, the climate just got too intense. It wasn't so much the political pressure as the financial stakes. When this shit happened, when Charlton Heston went into that shareholders meeting, $30 million went into the balance. Charlton Heston, as the head of the National Rifle Association, impacted the Warner Brothers' bottom line. He stood there in the meeting, reading my lyrics like it was a page from the Planet of the Apes script. I got my 12-gauge sawed off. I got my headlights turned off. I'm about to bust some shots off. I'm about to dust some cops off. He didn't even know what he was talking about. These are the lyrics to Killer Cop, he said. Oops, I mean Cop Killer. He's so outraged, yet he doesn't even know the name of the record? It was some crazy hypocritical bullshit. Charlton Heston railing at that meeting sent the Time Warner stock into a tailspin. In life, Forget principles. Forget egos. Most people are all about money. Time Warner realized it was costing them big money to keep me around. They brought in a crisis specialist to look at my next set of recordings. I already had the Home Invasion album in the can, and I knew that some of the lyrics were going to raise eyebrows. Don't give a fuck about a cop or a G-man. They all talk shit, breath smelling like semen. I take them in the alley all alone, put them in the prone, pop, pop, pop to the dome. So, yes, I was still killing cops in my music. And no, that wasn't going to make me any more popular at the label. Dig, I said. All right, fine. Just give me a release from my contract. No harm, no foul. I still owed Warner two albums. I know Seymour Stein and Mo Austin felt bad letting me out of my contract but they understood I had to do what I had to do. I knew that if they put out any more Body Count or ice T albums, shit was going to be too hectic. The reality to me was this. I knew they wouldn't promote the record anyway. Even if they released it, they would try to let it slip quietly under the radar. So I took my album over to Brian Turner at Priority Records, and that was the end of my Warner Brothers adventure. A lot of folks get it twisted. But this is the deal. Time Warner was just looking out for itself, and I respected that. I still respect that. They never treated me like shit, never got mad or yelled at me. All those theories you still hear today, Time Warner sold ice down the river, hell nah. 
They didn't. It was just a gang of political and financial pressure. People think controversy helps your bottom line, but I disagree. There is a big trade-off. Yes, you sell some records, but with all the static, the cancellation of concerts, the hike in insurance for the shows you do get, there are way more costs that come along with controversy than benefits. I would never advise people that controversy is the way to blow up. You'll become known, but will it translate into money? Probably not. I always felt like I was the cat who was on the firing line. I was out there on that thin horizon, right at the edge of shit. If you fast forward a few years, Ted Turner pushed Death Row Records off Interscope over similar issues. It was a trickle-down effect. And because of that trickle-down, I caught a lot of flack from different rap groups. Ice T, you caved. You gave in to the man. Side bettors were out there, throwing in their opinions, trying to hurt my name. It's funny that the rap community ended up coming down on me harder than anyone in the mainstream. The Source magazine went in on me, over and over. An editor at The Source, Reginald Dennis, came at me with one particularly hard editorial. When he voluntarily removed Cop Killer from the Body Count album, he wrote, Ice-T allowed a devastating precedent to be set, opening the door for widespread censorship of rap. As far as the hip-hop world was concerned, I went from being a guy who was standing up for freedom of expression to being some weak-kneed motherfucker who wouldn't speak truth to power. But to me, the key to winning the game is, don't worry about everyone. Find out who's really on your team and then roll with them. My man Chuck D put it best. If you ain't in the battles, Chuck said, you shouldn't comment on the war. Chuck knew what I was dealing with. He'd had his own media battles with Public Enemy. So I always had the dudes I respected in hip-hop, cats like Chuck, telling the haters and side bettors to shut the fuck up. Walk in my shoes for a day. That was some stressful, hectic shit. That was heat coming from the government of the United States. I was in quicksand for months. There was no safe ground to stand on. Part 5. 99 Problems The most dangerous thing on earth isn't a gun, knife, or bomb. It's ego. Ice-T's daily game. 12. My career as a television actor all started with Fab Five Freddy. In addition to being a hip-hop personality, the host of Yo! MTV Raps, Fab's also a respected visual artist, Fred Brathwaite, and he used to show his work in some of the swanky L.A. galleries where Darlene worked for a while. We have been friends forever. We're pimp buddies. We sit back and talk a lot of fantastic shit. Fred was chilling at my house. At that time, I had a couple of screen credits. I'd done New Jack City. I'd done Trespass. We were just chopping it up when Andre Harrell called. Freddie put me on the phone, and Andre, who'd branched from his music executive career into TV production, asked me to do New York Undercover, a drama starring Malik Yoba and Michael DeLorenzo as police detectives. Andre was getting at me about coming on the show. I was playing it cold. Man, listen. I'm in the movies. I don't do that TV shit. Come on, Ice. Plus, let me tell you, y'all ripped off New Jack City. Oh, you're too big now, huh? Andre said. He pulled that black solidarity card on me. You can't help out a brother, huh? I said, okay, give me a bad guy character and I'll play it. The character was named Danny Up, some eccentric kind of criminal who was supposed to be running an early meth lab. It sounded pretty out there, so I said, cool. I flew to New York to do the show, and it was a great experience. It was shot just like a movie. They respected the shit out of me, and I had a great time. It was a one-off, but at the end of my shoot, they got the dailies, liked what they saw, and I got another call. Ice, would you stay around? We don't want to kill you at the end of the episode. I told them, no way. When you do television, there's a salary cap for guest stars. Back then, it was only about $7,000. Network and production companies do that so that guest stars have no leverage to negotiate. If I did a guest spot on New York Undercover, I got the same money as Henry Winkler. 
seven grand wasn't really cutting it for me. After taxes and expenses, I had to put Shawnee Sean up in a hotel and partying in New York. I walked away with the grand. They asked me to stay, but I said, nah, I got to get back to L.A. The producer said, we can't pay you more, but we can sweeten the deal. We can get you more perks, put you in a better hotel. They put us in a better hotel and covered Sean's bills. So I said, fuck it, and I ended up doing two more shows. I got to be in the cliffhanger, the season's final episode, and I got to kill Malik Yoba's baby. I was cutting fingers off. I was a beast. Doing some crazy-ass sinister shit. I had a great time. Dick Wolf was the executive producer of New York Undercover, but I didn't know anything about him. Honestly, I never watched an episode of Law & Order. After my experience on New York Undercover, the Dick Wolf machine knew my style. They liked me. A few months later, I had an idea for this show called Players, which was a story about guys who go to prison and get turned around and come out and create a vigilante army. 